Welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you join us. Uh, my name is Megan Dugan Bassett and I am the Chicago Fellow at New America. Um, I run the Chicago office. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues, Autumn McDonald, who's a senior fellow and head of New America California and Molly Martin, the director of New America Indianapolis who coordinates local work at New America. Um, we are excited to learn from the panelists that we have today. Um, we will be um, over the next hour and a half learning from two different collaborative efforts. Um, the first we'll learn from is a um, joint effort by a number of foundations, nonprofits and researchers um, in Chicago to um, map um, historic inequality in Chicagoland and how that um, how we can address that as a community um, and um, also address vulnerability to the pandemic and to um, um, the economic um, downturn as a result of, um, or some of the economic effects of the pandemic. Um, second, we will hear um, from uh, my wonderful colleague uh, from the Future of Land and Housing team at New America, as well as um, council person, uh, Lauren Kuby from Tempe, um, Arizona. Uh, we'll be hearing about some work that um, land and housing has done um, to map um, past housing loss in the Sun Belt and how that can inform local leaders as they prepare for potential housing loss following the pandemic. Um, just to give you a little quick introduction to two of our first um, speakers, um, Angelique Power is the president of Field Foundation. For the past four years, she's led an effort to center equity in the foundation's work, and she's doubled programs and grant making through really strategic partnerships with other foundations. Under her leadership, Field Foundation has changed how it funds, who it funds, has created accountability structures so that communities can review, community can review its work, um, as well as created heat maps that illustrate the design of inequity within Chicago, um, and also, also has updated its investment policy. Um, Jen Axelrod is the Director of Learning and Impact at the Chicago Community Trust. I am privileged to get to work with her quite a bit. She's one of the founding members of the Mapping COVID-19 group and is someone that I get to um, trade ideas with all the time. She's led incredible work to help the trust measure their impact in the community and to find new ways to measure progress towards the trust goal of eliminating the racial wealth gap in the Chicagoland area. Um, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Autumn. Thanks so much, Megan. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm really glad that all of you have joined us for what is the two-part series on mapping inequity. Our second conversation, Mapping Inequity, Learning from the Future, will take place on July 20th at 2 p.m. Central, during which time we'll explore new projects around the country that are interrogating different types of inequity and finding new and creative ways to tackle them head on. In July, hosted by New America Local and the Justice, Health and Democracy Impact Initiative. New America Local is a distributed team at New America that works with local communities on issues of racial and economic equity. We engage and connect community partners, elevating the experiences and expertise of people whose voices frequently go unheard. And we work to help these ideas and perspectives inform policymaking. The Justice, Health, Democracy, excuse me, and Democracy Impact Initiative is a partnership between New America and Harvard's Safra Center. It's a new and integrated policymaking model through which national experts work directly with local leaders and practitioners to design effective policy supports and practical approaches for a new social construct, contract. Thanks again for joining us. And with that, I'd like to pass it or the pass mic, if you will, to Angelique and Jen, who will discuss the Chicago COVID mapping project. Thank you, Autumn. Um, we're going to pull up some slides and walk through some of them for you. Um, thank you so much. So, you know, we're understandably, we all know that we're in this moment that calls for massive change. But how does change happen? Sometimes it happens because of uprisings in the streets. 
And sometimes it happens because of systemic hacks that happen in the suites. Last summer, as these racial uprisings were happening, so many of us were joining together on Zooms and we were discussing the racialized outcomes of COVID. We were hearing as our colleagues and our partners were trying to solve for the moment, um, but often the conversations weren't actually grounded in history. Um, they weren't grounded in policy. And um, frankly, they weren't grounded in a recognition of the role we all have played to create the inequitable outcomes that we're seeing um, still through the pandemic. And so that's when this notion of mapping first started. Um, we wanted to map the actual causes of COVID and the actual crisis that we were facing. Um, we cannot solve for this moment blindfolded. And so we wanted to highlight where investment and lack thereof and where policy, when inequitable, has played such a role in the problems we're facing now and then create an interactive tool that allowed for action to come. So this mapping project um, is really meant to recognize history so that we could rectify history instead of ignoring it and ultimately repeating it. Um, slide. I'm going to say slide periodically because I am not driving. Um, so I want to be really transparent. We're showing you like a, a list of all kinds of names, but um, no one was paid to conduct the research or to be part of this project that we're sharing. The core team, many of um, these folks are foundations that have agreed to share private data about where their dollars had been going historically and, and how that um, changed during COVID. And we're gonna share a slide on this soon. The research team, these are a bunch of different institutional researchers that came together and actually lent institutional resources and support for weekly meetings that continue with the data research team. And then the partner section, these are folks that came along as soon as they heard about the project and again, agreed to share private data that's not out there. Um, this is not ultimately about any of these individuals or entities. This is really an open mapping project where everyone is invited to be a part of it. Slide. Um, so part of our task was to have a process around mapping and then have a meta reflection on how mapping pro projects themselves can be problematic. Um, and so we always start by saying that whenever you set out to map things, um, maps lift certain things into visibility and obscure other things into further invisibility. So many Chicagoans that we care about and um, what matters to them are systemically not included in mapping projects. Slide. For example, incarcerated people are excluded from census data. COVID-19 positive rates often are reflective of where testing sites are or have been. Um, and being undocumented raises so many vulnerabilities related to health and to employment and income. And those vulnerabilities are not easily captured by typical data sources, so they don't show up in mapping projects. Um, and the other thing to mention is that we're gonna be talking about geography and race. Race is a social construct. Um, and even within geographies, things are not homogenous. So we wanna start by saying that as well. Slide. And I'm sorry, I'm just turning off my binging noise. Um, okay. So while maps can be incomplete, um, they do bring clarity and transparency. And so our goal with this project was really to um, provide access to a lot of private information to equip organizers primarily so that they have a sense of where dollars are moving. Um, we wanted to equip investors that are from the foundation space that are from the public sector and private sector to actually be able to plan forward with policy in mind and also with the sense of where other dollars are going. Um, we wanted to talk to policymakers and make sure that we aren't creating new policies that actually look a lot like the past inequitable policies. 
And then um, finally, and Jen is leading this charge, we wanted to standardize data collection because for example, many of the foundations were in this moment of, of you know, awakening and racial justice, but many of the foundations don't ask about um, if, if you're a BIPOC led organization and there isn't a standard definition of what that even means, right? So if you're not asking if you're a black indigenous people of color led organization, you're not tracking if your dollars are going there. If you're not tracking, you're not reporting out on it. If you're not reporting out on it, you can't be held accountable to it. Slide. Um, what this slide means is that community members own the term philanthropy. We saw this throughout the pandemic and, and throughout history, really. Mutual aid networks that really are philanthropy in motion, um, how individuals give to each other daily. For the purpose of this project, we're mapping institutional resources and how they move. Slide. This is our working thesis. Um, policies, lack of investment, created this incredible crackling tinderbox. And not just in Chicago, but across the country and the world. And it cannot even yet be contained. But there absolutely will be other matches. COVID was just the current match that ignited it. And so our task is not to solve for COVID, but to dismantle the tinderbox that we're going to illustrate over the next few slides. Slide. Um, and because maps are not predictive, we just want to state that there are outstanding questions that we can't clock in these slides. So we still don't know how many jobs will be lost and won't return, how many bodegas and restaurants will close, how many cultural institutions will shutter. Um, you know, these are things, these are questions that are outstanding. Slide. Um, in our larger group, as we were going through this process, one of the uh, members asked, why would people care about this? And it was such a good moment and such a good question, because I think we assume that, you know, it's the right thing and people are trying to plan their way from COVID to recovery. But um, I think a, a more compelling argument that we landed on was one of symbiosis which was really demonstrated by COVID, that if, if I am sick, then you are sick. If you cannot thrive, I cannot thrive. And so our fate is linked. And this isn't about helping certain neighborhoods or certain folks. This is really about how do we, by dismantling the tinderbox, help all of us. Slide. Okay, so here's the region that we're going to be evaluating. Um, Often in foundations, we focus on city centers. And so we really wanted to not just focus on Chicago, but to include small towns and some suburbs. So you are looking at Cook County. Um, this has a population of 5 million people. Average household income is about 63,000 and it is highly segregated. Um, white families are showing up in yellow. Black families are showing up in blue. Latinx families are showing up in green. Slide. And the main thing to take away from this slide is something that we know, COVID is not impacting everyone um, universally. So Black people have been dying at the highest rates. Latinx people are being infected at the highest levels. Slide. And this is not because of something inherent in Black people or Latinx people. Um, this is consequential. These are systems that are working overtime to deliver this result, which we'll demonstrate. Slide. So within Cook County, we created a study area and that's where the black lines are. So keep an eye on these black lines as we move forward throughout the slides. Um, the study area is based on areas that are 85% or more black, indigenous, people of color, and more than 25% live below the poverty line. Slide. So we start by clocking policies. And in looking at inequitable policies, the foundation of the current tinderbox started a long time ago um, with housing. And this is something that applies to so many communities, but certainly Cook County, as federal policy prevented lending to Black neighborhoods. 
um, severely limiting where people could live, the type of structures they could inhabit, um, the ability to save money as predatory lending and housing covenants and other practices made home ownership expensive and elusive. And home ownership is not only the fundamental building block of generational wealth, it's the fundamental building block of generational health. Next slide. So um, you can still see the red dots, which represent redlining. Um, it made up not only 80% of the study area is still impacted by decades old redlining. That imprint lives on through public and private investment. And so the color red that you see on the map shows where the lowest amount of private investment in housing and subsequently the lowest home values are in the region. Next slide. Now we're looking at education policy. Um, the red dots that you see are when 50 schools were closed in the region a few years ago. The majority of them, as you can see, were closed within this study area. Slide. Now, this isn't to say that no dollars are moving and no investment is happening. What you're looking at is, um, are the dollars that are invested in incarceration rates. And so the purple that you're looking at indicates the large investments that are going toward policing, incarceration, surveilling, and removal of community members from our study area. Next slide. Um, in many ways, this slide speaks for itself, but you know we've seen headlines throughout the pandemic about how people with diabetes are um, contracting COVID. And, and there's like a barely uh, veiled implication that people are responsible for getting COVID rather than you know, having a conversation about who has access to fresh food and to jobs and to healthy solutions. Slide. So we have a study area to reframe that notion, we have a study area that has been primed with pre-existing conditions, whether that is high blood pressure, this map is of diabetes, the next slide if you wanna to go to it, I believe is of high blood pressure. Um, these are all consequences of living in poverty. So um, we've actually had a study area that has had people for a long time who are exposed and vulnerable, again, that tinderbox waiting for the next match. Slide. We wanted to also show where individuals with disabilities and especially those that are both BIPOC and disabled um, live. And what you're seeing is um, that there's such a crossover actually between a distribution of individuals with disabilities, not in the same way throughout the entire county, but they're clustered in the communities that have these systemically racist policies that have significantly contributed to worse health um, and well being outcomes. Slide. We call this slide three, two, one. COVID's brutal force hits. And you can see the positive case rates shown. But note that the major clusters that are happening inside the study area don't sit, don't stay inside the study area. It spreads. So again, symbiosis. If you are sick, I am sick. If you, I cannot recover, you cannot recover. Our ability to thrive is dependent on shifting the study area in this tinderbox. I great. So what do we know? So Angelique um, started to help us understand, but why couldn't we contain the spread of, um, of COVID in Chicago and, and in other communities? And we know that because in order to keep the economy going, to allow some to work from home, we needed essential workers who weren't able to quarantine, but headed to the front lines to serve for those with money to stay at home. They were our grocery store clerks, restaurant staff, healthcare workers, public sector employees who drive the buses, trains, silver mail prescriptions, manufacturing work floors. Um, next slide, please. And as you can see, the essential workers, predominantly black and brown in Cook County, lived in the red aligned areas, the study areas, and in the areas of poverty. Next slide. 
While those who work from home often have health insurance, this slide shows those on the front lines often do not, leaving those that are protecting us very unprotected. The black areas here show the percentage of population, or the red areas here, sorry, show the percentage of populations without health insurance. Slide. Perhaps one of the most chilling maps shows the contrast between where health centers are clustered, showing up in green on the map and where are nearly empty study areas. So where those that are dying and infected at higher rates of COVID are the furthest from their healthcare providers. Slide. So this slide's actually a little bit deceptive because it doesn't capture the full breadth of the mental health crisis in our city and in our study areas. We can see that many of the South Side communities have no mental health clinics, but we cannot see is that nearly a decade ago, the city of Chicago closed half of its mental health clinics, nearly all of which were used predominantly by BIPOC people and communities. This has increased wait time, sometimes up to a month or more for psychiatric services. And those that cannot access services instead are often end up getting treatment at the largest mental health service provider in the area, which is the Cook County Jail. The jail is also one of the biggest incubation sites for COVID-19 and has been shown to be a significant source of community spread as employees and inmates became infected and in turn infected others in their communities. So again, our structural inequities come full circle and show that if I am sick, you are sick. Slide. And what about pharmacy access? Again, the pattern is going to repeat itself. Slide. And there's also this pattern repeating itself with a noticeable lack of grocery stores. So the very same people who are not having access to pharmacies and healthcare also are not able to access high quality, reasonable cost food and nutrition, further compounding the health factors that we just talked about previously. You can see it's most acute on the south and the far west side of our city. Slide. Some of this information that we've talked about already, you know. We've seen a lot of this talk. Um, we've talked about this a lot. And now we're getting to the point of when do we stop admiring the problem? Then these maps help us ground ourselves in the conversation in this knowing and help us plan from here. And to think about what are the resources and influence and mandate to chart recovery. So we have a choice. Slide. We have a choice in how we think about government funding. So let's start here. Slide. We've started by mapping, and this was the original rounds of PPP loans. And you can see that this is more of an example of how the communities that we are focusing on here were systematically overlooked in the initial round of funding. Uh, when we look at the map of how the CARES Act dollars were distributed in Cook County, um, we see more equitable. Oh, we can see that again, the PPP loans completely skipped our study community. Next slide, please. But we can also see that there's an ability to be intentional. And so this study shows where the suburban Cook County CARES Act dollars go. You'll note that Chicago is grayed out because they got a different amount of, they got a different funding pool. So this is just showing the Cook County dollars. And you'll notice that with their intentionality, um, there was a much more equitable distribution of dollars. They worked to develop an equity formula, and they thought about things like poverty, not just population. So this is a very good example how a simple policy change that was made in, that resulted in more equitable funding distribution. And we can see that from the map that more per capita funds are reaching Cook County areas of highest need in our study area. Next slide, please. And we can see again that the city is um, that we see these, again, patterns of who is and who is not getting access to this. Um, so in this case, this, this slide represents access to stimulus checks. So this was when people were first getting their stimulus checks, and there were large sections of the population that weren't being included, and so had to receive EIP letters by zip code. So you'll see that a majority of the, the individuals who received le letters who didn't get payments were in the zip codes of our study areas. Next slide. What we also see here is that we can start to be more intentional. And this shows where the city of Chicago prioritized 
and started to learn from how they can do small business relief. And they began to think through, and as their funds have become um, more prevalent, we've also seen that they've started to make some pivots here, but there is a degree of intentionality to make sure that the funds are going to the south and west side. And we also know that we have more opportunities to do this. Slide. And that we can see that by targeting communities and asking for applications in our study areas, we are more likely to be able to get dollars to the communities where they're needed most. Slide. So this is one of the most challenging areas for us. And we just want to acknowledge that while we're working on this still, the hardest sector for us to, to really penetrate is the private sector. We have a group of willing companies that have been willing to share their data, but there's been a tremendous fear. We see some of that shifting over time, and we have seen since the start of the pandemic to where we are now, a greater willingness. Now it's getting to, to the point that Angelique started with, what's the data, how do we standardize it, and how can we have a more collective conversation of shared accountability and transparency? So this side goes from being blank to being populated with the changes and trends that we know um, the commitments that our private sector wants to make and is starting to make in terms of being accountable. Next slide. We also know to Angelique's point that as we said, community owns philanthropy, but community hasn't always directed where our philanthropic dollars go. And we know that philanthropy has an opportunity here to really dig in and institutionalize the practices that many started during COVID and make those changes and shifts permanent within our, within our structures and within our communities. We wanna acknowledge that a group of foundations stepped forward and shared their data. We continue to think about how do we refresh this data. So this is from early in the pandemic and now we're in the next phase of data gathering because we want to ensure that our communities have the most accurate and real-time data that we can to talk about where our dollars are going and what we're doing. So the next slide, please. So this shows where grant dollars were going prior to COVID. And you can see that the majority of the dollars were going to organizations whose headquarters were located outside of our study areas. It's important to note that while our, um, this might be not completely representative because of headquarter locations don't always represent where service locations are, we can also see that a lot of those dollars aren't flowing to the communities in our study areas. Next slide. We wanna point out that even within that, we see this profound COVID shift where we see a tremendous and swift response from foundations shifting where dollars were going. Um, they, made, they came together, they created more robust funds, we changed application practices, we thought about criteria, we thought about eligibility and reporting. And we see that those changes began to translate in real, in really meaningful and transparent ways into dollar shifts within our community. Next slide. So here's just a side-by-side -side comparison. Where were we a year ago and where were we at the start of the pandemic? And as I said, in a few months or a few weeks, we'll be able to say, and where are we now? And we have to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable to the shifts that our communities want and need and that those dollars continue to flow and we don't slide back or revert back to the practices we were doing before. Next slide. So the big aha is that while COVID is catastrophic and it has been profound, it is ultimately irrelevant. It is just the current match. We absolutely cannot solve for COVID. We have to replace the tinderbox with something that is nourishing, abundant, generates locally sourced power rather than depletes us. And the final takeaway that we hope you'll join us in interrogating and thinking it through, that we can't let the story of the pandemic be about needing behavior change, but rather about policy change and our work and writ large. It's not about rapid response, but long-term resource change. We have the data. We hope you'll join us in using it. Thank you. 
Jen and Angelique, thank you so much. Uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Molly Martin from New America Local. I really enjoyed that. So uh, Angelique and Jen, just jumping right in, I'm down in Indianapolis, another great migration city that struggles with uh, some of the segregation that Chicago faces. And that's a really challenging environment in which to deal with this sort of, of aid and recovery. Angelique, you said several times you coined the phrase, if I am sick, you're sick, we're all sick. We share that, um, that moment, that loss, and that kind of drain on our moral and economic resources. Tell me how you avoid letting that thinking slip into a rising tide lifts all boats moment, because you know there are some people out there who are waiting for it. So how do you, how do you keep it clean and, and make sure people stay focused on the, if I'm sick, that the I might mean someone who's really marginalized? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is incentivize change so that people aren't um, thinking that they are working on behalf of others, you know, that we all want to be designers of our own destiny. We, we don't want to be the, the beneficiaries of someone's benevolence. And so I think a lot of what we're looking at is how there's been a careful design over who has agency over their own life has access to the things that are the building blocks of, um, you know, a, a thrivability that, you know, some have and others don't. You know, if you look at how this plays out, you look at things like that are meant to uh, create equality, but create inequity. So you look at things like a school funding formula, for instance, and how it's based, you know, locally around property taxes. And so obviously, if you are not allowed to actually have home ownership. And there are areas that have, you know, a little amount that's going into the schools, then you're never gonna actually create equity inside of school system. And so some of the hacks that are natural jumps from what we're showing in terms of changing policy have to do with recognizing the inequity, not assuming that because we're all in this boat together that we all have access to the same things, but assuming the opposite we don't all have access to the same things. And so we have to rejigger the system to right that ship. Thank you so much, Angelique. And, and Jen, that brings me to you. You talked about um, the way that remaking kind of eligibility, remaking the gates to resources, whether those were grant funding, small business loans, et cetera, um, became really important part of, of what you learned through this project. And what Angelique just said lets us know that that we do need to recognize some agency. So tell me about a barrier you saw to your average Chicagoland resident, especially on the west or the south side, accessing grants or small business loans. Where was their agency being taken away? So we saw that and we heard some really compelling stories when people were going in to apply for small business loans. And they might not have had the paperwork to even begin to access that. Another thing we saw was as soon as there was an error in their paperwork, because the, the density, the number of applications was so big, their applications just got rejected. And so what we saw was other community agencies stepping in to review and build connections between small business applications and banks in order to help more of our small business owners be able to apply and successfully receive those dollars. So I think that's just an example of what did we see where there was inherent barriers if you didn't have a relationship with the bank, if you weren't um, a more sort of established institution, the kind of paperwork that you were asked to do was just a barrier inherent into your ability to apply and, and succeed. Great, that's so helpful. So a, a note to all of the funders I know who are watching, make sure that you are not alone in your review of these opportunities and your review of eligible folks. So Angelique, coming back to you, we look at the folks, you said the study area folks, right? How aware are they that they're in the study area? Do, do the residents you worked with and talked to kind of feel, do they ever feel studied to death? And how do you work with that feeling of kind of being under a microscope? Well, I, I'll take your, the answer in two parts. One, you know, I think when we shared this with a lot of community organizers and different groups, a lot of what they said was everybody knows about these inequitable policies. So like the beginning of the presentation is not a surprise to folks, whether it's called a study area or called just like, you know, the what they deal with on in their neighborhood in terms of schools, in terms of not having grocery stores, 
in terms of it taking 60 minutes to get to a low paying job because there aren't, you know, small businesses in certain areas anymore. So that was really actually well known. We found that it was outside of the quote unquote study area that we had to really begin with the history of an equitable policy more than those that lived inside of it. Um, and this kind of ties to the question you were asking Jen too, you know, because there are funders that are on the call, the fact that this is private data of where dollars have gone that, that had to be released is a part of the non-accountability that there is. You know, the fact that there's no standardized way of reporting out on where your dollars are going, um, that leads to this non-transparency that takes agency away from folks within the quote unquote study area. And so um, a part of what we're attempting to do is shift power. So access to information is democratized power. So the more that people are able to say, who's making the decisions, who's being harmed, who's being helped, who's being funded, um, the more that we are all collectively responsible for each other. Excellent. And I love your point about sharing power and transparency being the key to that. Uh, speaking of power, it's very powerful. The little things make a big difference, right? A flat tire can take someone off their economic course if things are precarious enough. And so, Jen, as you're looking at um, the programs that funders and local leaders wanted to mount, did you get any pushback from residents saying, thank you for giving me this banana, but what I really wanted was an orange? And, and what was the avenue in for folks to tell you, hey, your program design is off. So I think that was actually one of the most profound shifts that we saw and experienced during COVID. Um, I, prior to, we did a lot more of what you were just describing. Here's what we think we should fund, and here's the dollars that we're going to give you to do it, and then you go do what we're saying. What we saw during COVID is a increased humility and recognition that we don't know what community needs. Community knows what community needs and how best to achieve that. And so what we saw was philanthropy sort of getting out of the way of empowering community to have their own agency. We saw them getting out of their way in terms of saying, how quickly can we give you the money you need? How can we minimize those reporting burdens? And how can we lift up and share what you are doing with another community so that people can learn in real time the evolution? And also we saw a great meal of nimbleness that we don't always see. Um, and not every philanthropy could do this, but what we saw was what we might've funded at the beginning of the pandemic, but was a little bit different than what communities needed in the sort of halfway through part and what communities need now as they persist in addressing the current impacts of COVID and begin to pivot towards recovery. And so we saw that flexibility start to come into play and a recognition of the power of that when you are funding within community, driven by community, um, and really just making the dollars available through trust-based philanthropy. Trust-based philanthropy, that's definitely, definitely key. So here in, in a last moment before we transition to take a deeper dive in another city, Angelique, I'd kind of like to give you um, the last word for now. And I'd love you to give a little pep talk to someone who is watching this event and wants to mount kind of a looking back in order to move forward style initiative in their town. What do they say to the folks who say, it's uncomfortable for me to look back. We don't need any more pain. We've been through enough. Talk us through it. Okay, Molly, I will do my best with that. Um, what, I, what I will say is that we've been through the hardest year and a half any of us have experienced. And the next year and a half is more important than the one that is behind us because the choices we make, the way we are willing to change, the way we are willing to move apart from what's comfortable and known, move outside of our institutions, and be willing to radically change ourselves in a way that is grounded in an understanding of race and racism, in a way that is hopeful and optimistic that we can build something different, that will dictate what our lives and our children's and our grandchildren's lives will be for the next hundred years. This is, this is our moment. This is our moment to do something radically different. And all we have to do is be willing to look 
closely at ourselves at our history and build collectively based on needing to change the systems and we can do that we can do that indeed thank you so much angelique jennifer axelrod uh, megan i'm going to swing over to you so we can take a deeper dive elsewhere Awesome. Thank you all. I feel like I just watched a masterclass. I, that was amazing. Um, so I am so happy to introduce uh, our second two panelists, um, Tim Robustelli and Councilperson uh, Lauren QB. Um, Tim is a policy analyst for the future of land and housing at New America, as I mentioned earlier. And he's one of the authors of this really great report um, on the New America website called Displaced in the Sun Belt. Um, he's a former, he was a former intern at the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation in New York, and he graduated summa cum laude from the University of Vermont, the major in history, um, and also has a master's degree in international relations from New York University. Uh, Council person Lauren QB was kind enough to join us the day after her vacation. Uh, she is on the city council in Tempe and was um, elected in 2014. She's been a longtime advocate for worker protections, equity, and ch climate change action, and her um, list of uh, accomplishments is very long. Um, she's a recognized national champion for cities as incubators of innovation. And uh, one of the things I found most interesting in her bio is that she's also led efforts to expose the corrupt influence of dark money in lo local politics. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tim and Lauren um, to present. Thanks so much, Megan. And I believe we have some slides that will be shared as well. Um, so while those pop up, I'll just say hi, everyone. And thanks to uh, Megan, Molly, and Autumn, uh, and uh, the rest of the New America local team for organizing this great event. Uh, I'm Tim Robustelli. I'm a policy analyst uh, with the Future of Land and Housing team, as Megan said. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you want to say hi before we jump on in. Hello, just glad to be here. Um, I also work at ASU at the Stardust Center for Affordable Homes and the Family, which makes all those connections among transportation and health and food access and you know all of the social determinants of health and housing issues. And so we're very focused on housing and security at ASU as well. And I think this what you're going to see today is also a product of uh, a collaboration with the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience and Patricia Solis. So I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you, Tim. Yes, thanks, Lauren. Uh, very much appreciate you joining us. And um, yeah, this work would not have been possible without our partners at ASU. So uh, we thank them. Um, so today we'll be speaking about uh, my program's work on mapping and analyzing housing loss uh, in the Sun Belts or you know, the bottom half of the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So before I jump into the work, I'll just quickly introduce my program. Uh, Future of Land and Housing program aims to solve today's housing, land, and property rights challenges, both at home and abroad. Through our research, writing, and convening, uh, we strive to connect new constituencies and shed light on underreported issues in the property rights space. Uh, next slide, please. And so I'll be talking about a recent report, as Megan mentioned, uh, displaced in the Sun Belts. Uh, and so why did we choose the US Sun Belt? Um, for a number of reasons. First, uh, large Sun Belt metro areas accounted for almost half of all population growth in the US between 2010 and 2016. And this growth is uh, leading to increasingly diverse cities uh, when it comes to race and ethnicity, the age of residents, socioeconomic strata, and the types of jobs being added to local economies. Uh, Houston, one of the most diverse and dynamic cities in the US is often cited as a bit of a harbinger of what uh, other US cities will look like uh, in the coming decades. But at the same time, all of this growth is uh, putting increased pressure on real estate markets in the Sun Belt. So we're seeing housing prices rise rapidly. And uh, most recently, uh, Sun Belt metros account for six of the 10 largest metros, with the highest share of severely cost burdened households when it comes to housing costs. And that means that these families are putting more than half of their monthly income towards rent or mortgage payments um, every month. And we know from our previous work that the Sun Belt had some of the highest housing loss rates in the country. And that's driven in the Southwest by states such as Arizona and Nevada, and in the Southeast uh, by Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. So certainly a region of the United States that, that warrants some further exploration when it comes to housing loss. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we do in our study? 
uh, we mapped and analyzed evictions, foreclosures, and then combined housing loss across seven case study locations. Uh, and this ranged from very large cities in the US, such as Houston and Phoenix, to some smaller to mid-sized cities, such as Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we looked at data on evictions and foreclosures from 2017 to 2019, so right before the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. And while we pulled individual records from the courts and some other data sources, we visualized and analyzed them at the census tract level, which gives us more or less a neighborhood understanding of where displacement or housing loss is occurring. And we just didn't want to look only at the numbers. We wanted to sort of fill in the story from a qualitative side of things. So we conducted a key informant interviews in all of these case study locations to really understand the context behind the numbers. And we, don't, we did all this because we, under, uh, we believe that understanding where displacement was most acute and who was most impacted right before the pandemic can help us better predict or understand where COVID related housing loss may occur, especially after some of the eviction and foreclosure uh, protections expire as we work our way out of the uh, crisis. Next slide, please. So we're gonna zoom in today on one of our case study locations, Maricopa uh, County, Arizona, and specifically the city of Tempe. Um, so obviously Maricopa County is home to Phoenix and Tempe. It's also home to a number of other large cities, such as Mesa, uh, which is the largest uh, suburban city in the United States, which is a population just over half a million. Um, a few other big cities are Scottsdale and Glendale. So uh, certainly, uh, the center points when it comes to uh, Arizona. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, before I sort of show off some of the maps that we developed in this work, I thought it was important to just dis discuss some of the context behind the numbers. Um, in other words, uh, sort of touch on why families are housing insecure and why they experience displacement. So before the pandemic, something that we saw time and time again, not only in Maricopa County, but elsewhere in the country was sort of this uh, toxic combination of low wages and high rents. Uh, in Maricopa County, for example, average rent for a two room bedroom is, is $1,000. And that's roughly double what minimum wage workers can afford. So uh, they're often uh, struggling to uh, make ends meet uh, on a month to month basis. And then the pandemic hit. Maricopa County was a national hotspot when it came to the virus itself. And we also saw um, significant rise in unemployment as the economy shut down. Uh, just to give a sense of what that was like in Maricopa, uh, in November, 2020, uh, you know, about half a year after the start of the pandemic, uh, the unemployment rate was at 6.1%, which was nearly double uh, the level it was at the same time in 2019. And obviously that leads to a loss of income. Uh, so according to the U.S. Census Bureau, at that same time, about a quarter of all surveyed households in the Phoenix metro area expected uh, or were experiencing a loss of income. And with that loss of income uh, comes, excuse me, um, added difficulty in, in paying that rent and paying that mortgage and keeping a roof over your head. Uh, next slide, please. So what you see here is an example of one of our maps that we developed through some of this research. Uh, it looks at a ho housing loss rate by census tract in Maricopa County, uh, taking the 2017 to 2019 average. Now, obviously due to the size of Maricopa County, it's the fourth largest county in the United States by, by land mass, I believe, um, or it's up there. Um, it doesn't lend itself too well to a static image uh, looking at census tracts when it comes to housing loss. But these maps are all interactive online and I encourage everyone to go take a look. Uh, but what this does is it allows us to understand the geography of loss. And uh, the numbers behind this map also let us understand the scale of housing loss and who it's affecting most in Maricopa County. So based on the analysis that we ran, uh, the housing loss rate in Maricopa County during our, our study period was 3.8%, meaning that just under four of every 100 households uh, would experience loss every year. And in real numbers and real figures, uh, it's estimated that over 125,000 residents are experiencing loss um, every year. And so I'm currently sitting in, in Silver Spring, Maryland with a population of about 80,000. So just to put that in number, it's, it's more people than in the town I'm in experiencing displacement in Maricopa County every year. When it comes to who's affected most, uh, we know that renters are most affected uh, or were most affected. Um, 
housing or evictions accounted for 96% of housing loss uh, between 2017 and 2019. So uh, homeowners experienced displacement at a significantly less rate. Next slide, please. So what else can we tell from this data besides where people are losing their homes and, and who's most affected between renters and homeowners? Uh, we, can, we can look at when people are losing their homes through time series analysis. And the chart that you see to the left is the average number of evictions per month uh, between 2017 and 2019. You'll see that there's a low on average in March and there's a, uh, a spike in August and the summer months in general. And we see a 53% increase between that high and that low. And we're not quite sure why this is happening, why we're seeing this, but we have a couple of hunches, such as the financial burden of high utilities during the hotter months, especially in Arizona, uh, one of the hottest states for sure, and some of the highest utility costs as well. Uh, there could be increased costs of childcare and groceries during the summer months as children are out of vacation, uh, putting added pressure on uh, family budgets. And there's also a high demand for rental housing during this time of year. You know, people are moving around and this may cause landlords to finally move forward with an eviction as they can fill that vacancy quicker than usual. Uh, next slide, please. And so besides where and when people are losing their homes, uh, if they're renters or homeowners, uh, we can also run a bit of analysis uh, to understand who socially, who demographically are losing their homes. You know, we can pull socioeconomic and demographic information from the U.S. Census Bureau to have a better understanding of the makeup of households uh, in census tracts that are experiencing uh, high rates of housing loss. And so in Maricopa County, we saw that census tracts containing more immigrant households, more Latinx households, uh, more single mother households experience higher rates of overall housing loss. And these are traditionally marginalized groups. So unfortunately, uh, maybe that's not so surprising. Uh, another thing that we saw was that of the census tracts with high rates of uninsured residents, nearly 80% of those tracts had above average housing loss. Uh, and that makes sense too, unfortunately. Often vulnerable households often can't pay for housing and healthcare, especially after an unexpected medical emergency. And the last one that I'll touch on that we find interesting is that household, or excuse me, census tracts in which households, in which more households depend on public transportation often experience higher rates of housing loss as well. And so often dependence on, you know, an unreliable bus or train can lead to repeated tardiness or absence at work. Uh, someone gets fired, uh, loses income and can't pay for uh, the rent or the mortgage. Next slide, please. And so what does this all mean for housing loss amid COVID-19? Well, it allows us to better understand who has traditionally lost their home um, and where we should think about targeting uh, resources, aid, and outreach um, in a more efficient and effective manner. Um, you know, what we've seen in the past 18 months, in the last 15 months, is that the response, especially from the federal government trickling down, has often been slow and uneven. So data like this allows policymakers at the local level to, to better understand where aid is needed most and, and direct resources appropriately. Next slide, please. And so we're going we're gonna to go even deeper um, and, and look at one city in particular, uh, Tempe, Arizona. Uh, my colleagues and I at the Land and Housing Program have been lucky enough to work with uh, Council Member uh, Cubie and some folks with the city of Tempe um, to really understand uh, you know, recent trends in housing loss um, and, and how that can inform um, how the city formulates policy, what their outreach looks like. Um, next slide, please. And so I'll move through these slides relatively quickly and then council member QB, uh, please feel free to jump in at the end. Um, I'd love to hear some of your local insights on, on what we're seeing, but Basically, this kind of data allows us to look at the city level, at the neighborhood level, where housing loss is most acute. You'll see that this is eviction rate by census tract uh, in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, next slide, please. Tim, can I interrupt to say, I know Absolutely. Um, with, with New America and the Knowledge Exchange for Resilient, Resilience, if you look at that previous map, uh, they correlate with our Black and Latino households, the, the purple areas pretty strongly the dark purple areas, but there was even a stronger correlation uh, among uh, in the in the data looking at uh, households 
who are in the shadows, who are uh, you know, undocumented residents, who have particular, you know, we have particular challenges because they're living in the shadows and don't necessarily wanna come out to food distribution centers or, or get assistance. So in this information that you gave us allowed us to do like direct, direct outreach to those who are sometimes harder to reach, but have the most need. So I just wanted to show in that map how important that data is to our city, so. Absolutely, thanks so much for that insight, Lauren. Um, next slide, please. And so this is just a, a slightly different map looking at um, housing loss by census tract. So that's combined uh, evictions and foreclosures. Excuse me, so looking at the entire scale of displacement and you'll see that the geography of this is, is slightly different as this accounts for both uh, renters and homeowners. And uh, Lauren, before I pass it over to you for the last couple of slides, I'm not sure if you have, if you have anything to add here as well. I can't believe I did that. If you notice the darkest area, it's actually around the university, um, which kind of makes sense because we have a high, we're very transitory congressional district and area. And so there's a lot of influx of population and, and we have students that come in um, who are from other countries as well, who just sort of leave and don't necessarily um, follow through with the right processes or leaving the, their apartment and can get eviction when they're not necessarily eviction. So that dark spot in the middle may show a little, it's a little bit of an anomaly because uh, I know the eviction data, data isn't as clear cut as we want to see it, and, and the court systems can't necessarily translate and say, oh, that is um, people that are leaving, they just haven't, you know, filed with their landlord that they are leaving. So I know it's not necessarily black and white each, each case. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. I was just struggling to get myself off uh, mute <laughs> as well. Um, next slide, please, Lauren. I think I can turn it over to you to uh, to round out the presentation. Sure. I just in the middle of the presentation wanted to throw this in because we are talking about mapping inequities, and in addition to all the work that New America is doing with the City of Tempe um, and the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience at ASU, we're also working with with uh, the Biodesign Institute and Rolf Halden, a scientist in his lab. We study wastewater analysis and wastewater as it relates to equity. And we've done this with opioid studies and we're able to really shift very quickly once COVID hit to study uh, the, the remnants of, um, of COVID virus in our wastewater. Now, if you notice area one in this map is very large and that's kind of the problem. We're trying to divide that up into certain, into di discrete areas so we can have a, a more robust analysis and geographic analysis. But if you notice area two, that pink area is amongst, is where we still see sort of COVID over, you know, over a concerning number. And that happens to correlate to the poorest part of Tempe where there are more un, undocumented neighbors and residents and where there are um, higher proportion of you know, lower income residents. So we're using this information along with, uh, with the New America data to really pinpoint and geographically target the residents we need to get to. So I wanted just to give an example of other inequity mapping in the equity mapping that's done in the city. Next slide. So you might be asking, what are we doing with this data? I was first approached by Tim in New America back in the, was it this summer, Tim, last summer, and was very keen knowing that you were doing a Maricopa study to look really to drill down into Tempe and look at the sub-census tracts. And we had a very receptive uh, audience with uh, our new mayor council, new mayor, Corey Woods, to look at this data and we have a very strong relationship with ASU as well. You know, ASU is the most innovative university in the country, I think five years running and maybe six now. Um, so we wanted to look at this data, not from this esoteric uh, ivory tower point of view, but to really be able to target, to target rent and utility aid to, with flyers and mailers um, to our residents who are most in need, who we thought most be, must be most in need given this, the, the mapping that was done. And we also decided we're, we're gonna go beyond this. Let's have an eviction forum. Let's bring all the partners together, people working on the field, on the ground, social justice organizations, um, volunteers. Let's bring everybody together and talk about ways we can um, combat the housing crisis and also be prepared for the eviction, the tsunami that we, we, we all expect. Um, so one of the main findings, it may not seem that revel revelatory to you, but it was, it was to me in a way, it's like, we need to go where people are. It's not enough to do flyers and mailers and, and social media posts. We need to really connect with people where they are. So 
grocery stores, food distribution centers. And we need to have food distribution centers, maybe not be centers, but have, have social justice organizations take some of those food boxes and distribute it to people in the shadows who don't even want to go to a food distribution center and are, and are very afraid of, of going out into our, our city. You know, Arizona has some very challenging immigration laws and pressures now. So it's very understandable why, why those who are undocumented would, would kind of fear that kind of interaction. So we really made an effort and with, with, with flyers um, and you know, door hangers to get to people and to work with social justice organizations to spread the word. Because oftentimes like in utility rent assistance, there's people that know, I don't wanna say work the system, it's not a negative thing, but they just know where to go for help. But usually the people in my experience that are most in need don't know where to go. And so you need to actually go where people are. And so that was one of the big revelations of reform, which came out of the work that we were doing in New America. And we also are now looking into pro bono tenant representation in neighborhoods. We have um, some, some organizations that help and we're assisting them. And we realize we can't get involved in contract disputes, but we can definitely point people to resources. And uh, we also have something called Equity in Action. And that is a partnership with Vitalist Foundation. And if any of you know about Vitalist, Vitalist makes all those connections amongst the social determinants of health and housing loss and, and community and personal health. And so we worked with them. They helped us to fund Equity in Action. And we had an innovation fund from the city that year. And so we invested with social and racial justice organizations and individuals, so paying individuals, paying organizations to be part of our decision-making. We thought this was so crucial. And in our climate action planning, for example, uh, we're not just paying them to give us opinions. They're running their own climate action forums in their communities to give us direct feedback that is unfiltered through the city staff process. We love our city, we love our staff, but sometimes people are more comfortable talking to their neighbors about issues related to the city rather than a city staff person. So equity in action has, has definitely um, used this housing data to really determine the areas that we should focus on. And then we have this continued partnership with the city of Tempe, the GIS staff. We have an amazing uh, GIS staff within the city that works with GIS students and researchers at the university and is working with, with you all on a pilot, a housing loss public tool that we're very excited about to be chosen. New America was one of the cities to um, to delve into this tool and we're eager for that partnership to, to expand. Um, I just wanna say one thing about the justice courts. So Maricopa County justice courts, you know, maybe I can be, we'll put the cones of silence here. I know this is publicly broadcast, but it can be challenging getting the data. And there is a justice uh, of the piece, Tyler Kissel, who's within Tempe, that has done some groundbreaking work and encouraging and working with the justice courts to become more modern, modernize their data collection and put their data collection to use. And we even have a constable who's, who attends all the eviction hearings. And we're finding that people are attending eviction hearings far more frequently than ever before. I think it's because of the ability of Zoom uh, to be, you know, to take part in an eviction hearing in a Zoom setting. And so we have a very innovative justice of peace who is really delving deep and wanting to help and to be you know, a partner in this and a collaborator in all of this not just a passive recipient of the data. And now I think that's, is that the last slide? I think that's it. Yeah, just a, a thank you to everyone um, and appreciate those insights, uh, Lauren. So Megan, I think it's back to you. Great, thank you guys. This is um, really exciting. I, my background is not in housing. So this is all kind of new to me and my background is kind of in the workforce development space. Um, I'm curious, uh, Tim, uh, if you can share more. I am not particularly familiar with the Sun Belt, um, and I'm really fascinated. One of the things we're seeing in Chicago is um, over the past several years, we've started to see, um, you know, large numbers of African Americans leaving Chicago and going to the Sun Belt. So we're kind of seeing a reverse migration. Um, I'm curious um, how you selected the locations that you um, completed case studies in and um, what else you can tell us about how um, eviction and um, and uh, mortgage um, uh, I'm sorry I'm not thinking the right term how housing the two different pieces of housing loss um, differ by the different um, states in the Sun Belt. Yeah absolutely um, so so this uh, report displaced in the Sun Belt was actually a follow-on to 
to a bit more of a, a broader research effort that we conducted uh, in 2020 that sort of looked at housing loss at the county level across the United States. Um, so looking at evictions and foreclosures uh, in all 3,000 counties or, or the two thirds of which uh, data was available for. And so through that analysis, we, we sort of had a better understanding of where in the country housing loss was most acute. Um, some states in the South kept on popping up over and over mm -hmm. again, which is why we sort of a bit naturally gravitated towards the Sun Belt and sort of the, the growth in the region, the, the diversity in the region was, was uh, appealing to us as a, a case study or an area for case studies as well. And when it came to specific cities, it came down to a few, a, a few reasons. One was data availability, um, just the, uh, the ability for us to get our hands on eviction and foreclosure data. As, as Lauren sort of touched upon, it's not always easy to get this data from the courts or to get it from uh, you know, local governments. So that was uh, a bit pragmatically a reason why we chose these locations. Um, another one was just the diversity of cases um, going from Norfolk, which is, you know, home to a major naval base, to Houston, which is, you know, just has, um, it really is a melting pot, to, to Phoenix, which is experiencing just a lot of growth, um, especially as everyone comes over from California. Um, so sort of pragmatically, those, uh, those things sort of factored into to why we, we picked these case study locations. And of course, the ability to, to work with wonderful partners like Warren. Um, we want to be on the ground. We want to be talking to people. We don't want to parachute in from Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> we want to have those conversations. Um, I'll stop there. I, I, I think you had, I think you had a, uh, a follow-up question. Um, about the difference between foreclosures and, and uh, evictions, but I'll, I'll see if Lauren has anything like that. I have nothing to add to that segment. Um, I'm curious, Tim, uh, yeah, sorry, I gave you two questions, which is a, never, you should never do that in an interview. Um, so I'm curious about how um, the two elements of housing loss differed over the different states that you looked at. Sure, well, I, I don't think I have, uh, I can't quite remember off the top of my head who, what state first closures were. Actually, that's a lie, excuse me. Florida was definitely at the top when it came to foreclosures from our previous analysis. And, and I think that's due to a number of combinations. It's, it's uh, second homes, um, you know, increased risk of flooding uh, due to natural disasters, mm -hmm. namely hurricanes. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, senior uh, citizens on fixed incomes um, who might not be able to, to cover uh, mortgages as um, prices change, as, as um, you know, they experience uh, unexpected um, expenses. So I believe that, that Florida was, was quite high when it came to uh, foreclosure. And when it came to evictions, I, I think it's South Carolina and it's, it's Arizona. And, and we saw it a little in Nevada as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, everywhere is just so different. There's, there's different laws. The, the demographics are different. Um, so the housing market itself can, can differ drastically from, from place to place. So I think uh, just sort of idiosyncratic factors uh, really pay into which places experience evictions more and which places experience uh, foreclosures more. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw you um, for a loop because I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question. So sorry in, in advance. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed in your report is you talk about, um, and this, I think this is different in, in Tempe versus other places, um, but overall the different places that you looked at, um, there was a real trend where um, African-American areas um, were, you know, most um, associated with um, housing loss. Um, you know, just coming from, this has been a really uh, challenging uh, time in our country, um, just from a race relations perspective, and I'm just imagining people saying, um, well, you know, this is a personal responsibility issue. This is just about, you know, people's choices. Um, what would you say to people? Um, what evidence do you have that shows that this is a bigger structural issue, that this is more than about personal, like individual problems and individual choices. Sure, um, Lauren, would you like to chime in first? Uh, I'm, I'm well, happy. Sure, I just think you, you can directly correlate, you know, the lack of generational wealth or the ability to build generational wealth into this equation, and 
I know like in, the city, in Central City South, the neighborhood in South Phoenix, there's only 17% home ownership. And how do you build wealth in a community without home ownership? So I, you know, I think it's really important to um, not just consider the, the data here, but you know, that's the hard data, but think about the soft data and think about the tools to enable residents to build their own leadership to, to, to be effective agents of change and both at the city, state and local, the city level, the regional level and state levels. I don't know if I answered the question. I kind of pivoted a little bit, but. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I, I know I threw you for a loop. Um, Tim, do you have anything to add uh, sure, to that? I'll I'll just jump in and, and I'll say, I think over the past year, there's been uh, a more explicit and, and a great conversation sort of around how we got to today, how we got to, um, you know, uh, black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods and, and how that that was uh, deliberate policy implemented from the federal level, the state level, the local level. Um, I mean, redlining is, is the one example that's, that's very well known and comes up again and again. And if you look at sort of historical maps of redlining and how that translates today um, to, to low income neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are experiencing high levels of displacements, um, I mean, the overlap is, is incredibly stark. So just, just understanding that the built environment that we live in is, is to an extent very deliberate. Um, and the inequities that, that we are seeing today are just been compounded over time due to a lot of conscious choices, um, you know, to, to um, you know, keep, keep some people uh, better off and, and others, um, you know, black and Latinx communities, um, you know. And could I add, it's, it's so important to build in permanent affordability. And that's why I see community land trust as being so crucial to at least in Arizona to our housing affordability picture because it enables people to get a home. They don't own the land, but they also, they build equity in their home. They build wealth, but there's not that just high barrier to entry of having to come up with it huge number of uh, housing uh, deposit and there's help with the deposit too that's you know it's not a loan it's a grant so i think me land trusts are one of the tools that we can use in arizona and specifically about arizona and i'm sure there are other states represented in this call uh, there is a preemption there is a preemption on inclusionary zoning so as a council member i cannot require a developer to build a certain amount of affordable housing or contribute to affordable housing trust fund now the new uh plan that joe biden is putting forward the american um the American Jobs and Families Plans, it calls for this, the national government preempting state government on this issue. So it would do away with preemptions on inclusionary zoning. So it would allow a city like mine to require affordability in a certain, mm -hmm. certain build. And that is so important. And that has helped to make Maricopa, the inclusionary zoning preemption has really helped to make Maricopa create this crisis and affordability that is greater than other counties, I'm sure of it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, and I think we're actually going to come back to that topic a little bit more in discussion so that we can open up to all the panelists. Um, I want to ask um, you a question, Lauren, and Tim, you can certainly jump in. Um, what's new and different about this data? And what are other ways you could envision state and local leaders using this type of analysis differently than they've used like past information they might have gotten? So Tempe is very focused on performance measures and, and giving metrics for our performance measures. So every year when we look at our budget, we say, well, what is the performance measure with, with something as large as poverty, or something as concrete as, as paving and concrete? And we see where have we gotten in our goals. And so it really helps us to guide our budget, it helps us to guide our spending. And so it's important in that way that we have these metrics. Um, to me, it, it shows that, but there's like a softer side of it is if, if we can map if we can map where housing insecurity is, we can also map a softer, more direct approach with our residents. We can be like, like um, political campaigns that go north, knock door to door and better yet get community uh, organizers and community leaders, social justice leaders to help us to reach out to people that need more help because we don't, you know, if people don't ask or don't know, they're not gonna get the help they need. And we can't do that for the entire city, obviously, that's a gargantuan task. So by targeting and knowing where the, issue, where the, the inequities are most, um, most apparent, that really helps us to target our resources, both, both financial and uh, human resources. Did I answer your question? Yes, absolutely. I have to ask that because we tend to. <laughs> yeah, 
Absolutely. So I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Molly, who's going to start us off on our broader discussion um, with all four panelists. Great. So interesting. So thank you, Tim. And thank you, Councilman Kuby. Uh, you know, actually, Angelique, I'm going to put you on the spot first, because you asked a good question in the chat of your fellow panelists about how they equipped local activists with the data. Do you want to say more about that? Yes, and I do feel like this is a part of the discussion that um, you all were just having. But I was curious, I love how you brought the data to organizers and social justice and racial justice and sort of said, how will this help your work? Um, and I was wondering because here in Chicago, the organizing community, they're visionaries and they have policy agendas that they're trying to move forward. And some of it is direct action um, and some of it is sort of longer term policy change. And so um, you were talking about how interconnected these issues are from housing to other economic inequities. And I just wondered if in the process of bringing the data, other things popped up like questions around building agency and generational wealth around you know, guaranteed income or minimum wage increase or, you know, and if so, how did you handle that? I'm thinking of one, um, I know that I was working with a group called ICNA Relief and it's a Muslim based organization that offers food distribution and meal, uh, meal distribution as well. And we looked at this, the, the little um, the community of La Victoria, which is one of our Tempe's most historic neighborhoods. And it's also a neighborhood with a lot of undocumented residents. And then knowing folks in Las Amelias, a group that works right in that neighborhood, we approached them and ICNA really said, we want to do a food distribution. Where should we do it? At the church? That's where people vote. This is a good place. And actually that group said, no, no, no. Uh, there's, we'll, we'll do that, but we need to have more direct distribution. We need to have people come in and they'll grab 10 food boxes and distribute it to families that will not, I think I referenced this before, that will not go to, to, to anything that, that smacks of distribution or central authority. Um, so that's been really a direct cause and a direct outlay, um, an outlay a direct result of, um, of working with the community and working, sharing that data with, uh, with our social justice advocates and organizations. On, on the question of public data, I want to pick on Tim for a minute, but please, everyone, feel free to jump in. Tim, you've talked and written a lot about something that came up in your presentation and also in the mention of open data in the Chicago presentation. Why, why isn't all of this free? Why, why as a taxpayer, can I not walk down to the city county building and ask them to show me all of the eviction data? Where, where are the holes in the system? Yeah, um, I, can, I can touch on that. Uh, absolutely. So I think the problem is that there's no mandate in a lot of places or there's no incentive for, for some of these stakeholders uh, that are dealing with eviction, that are dealing with foreclosure every day to collect this data, to steward it, to maintain it, and then to, to clean it and, and share it publicly. Um, you know, courts are, we talked to a stakeholder um, in Arizona, actually, who's, who's involved with the courts, and he said the courts are responsible for adjudicating cases. They're not necessarily interested in data collection. Um, while they may want to do that, they may not have the personnel, they may not have the capacity, they may not have the training. Um, so even when there is a desire, um, there's often a lack of resources. Um, so I think there, there needs to be more capacity building, uh, there needs to be more um, staffing, and, and perhaps that can come from the federal government, from the state governments. But um, right now, we're, we're just not seeing it. And, and that's why it's so hard to access this data, because there's no one responsible for it, basically. And I'm going to drop a, a data brief that you wrote on that very issue into the chat in just a moment. But Jenna wanted to ask you, in terms of getting access to the data and making sure that residents, and as Angelique said, um, activists have access that's affordable or even free, what, what are you running into in Chicago? What has worked? Where are you still hitting a wall? <laughs> uh, so we have a couple of walls, some of which is the lag time that it takes some of the publicly available data to, to make it um, so that we can digest it and make it available to the communities. So there's that piece about just how long it takes, who's included and who's not included and counted in that data, and how relevant the data that we can measure is for the communities that we see themselves. So a lot of what we hear when we talk to community activists and others is one, as Angelique said earlier, 
they know this, but they want their hyper-local data. And the data that we have is often not available at that level. People don't think in census tracts. In Chicago, they think in community areas and neighborhoods. In, um, in Arizona and Tempe, they may think in other ways. So they think in the different ways than data are available. So I think it's also worth noting that. Um, another piece that we're running into is people still getting comfortable with transparency and accountability. Um, and so that's an issue that we ran into and, and how do we share and the fact that even if we are comfortable, our data is just unique enough that you need to have people power to clean it, organize it, align it and report on it, which is not an easy thing. I mean, Tim was just talking about the issues in, in government and courts to release the data. We see that same issue in nonprofits. And honestly, we see that same issue in some of the philanthropies, right? They're not resourced to be able to have really robust data collection practices. And then the last thing I will say about the data is Sometimes the things that we most want to measure or most want to report on, we don't know how to measure or they're not easily measured or they're not measured in ways that we count as measurable data. So when we prioritize what we can quantify in quick units, we miss the robustness of mixed methods design and qualitative research and storytelling and the ways that communities make sense of their lived experience and the changes they see. And so I think it's important that as we do these, we always bring in that mixed methods design. And then the last thing I think we'll say is that we don't have a lot of ways to lift up the local data that is connected collected within communities that is so powerful. You know, so how do we create a data hub for local communities to share data that they're collecting within their community across communities? And that's not something we have yet, but I think it's a huge gap and one that could be really powerful. Angelique, you look you want to say something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead, Angelique, if you have something to add there. Um, you know, I was going to say something like much more skeptical, and I feel like what you shared was so lovely, Jen, but, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know the analogy, but there's no incentive for foundations or private sector to report out on one hand. Um, and so the reporting without that sort of um, accountability system and and actually the only ones who can create the accountability systems are the ones who are to be held accountable. There's kind of a um, intrinsic failure of being able to have this shared power and mutuality in this moment. Um, I think that um, what we've seen, you know, in the last few years and certainly during the pandemic is this democratized power that's coming from social media um, holding organizations to account. And so we've seen these large organizations be brought to their knees, um, not because of um, stakeholders, you know, in the company, but because of the lowest paid employee. Um, and so I think that there is, that's my optimism. That's my silver lining. Like, I think that there is a way, and I think that awareness of um, that you do have to show receipts, if you will, that, you know, if you don't, someone else will. I think that that is changing this conversation around how do we create accountability, but the onus and the methodology is still sitting with those who are to be held accountable. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, an issue there. Tim or Lauren, is there anything that that topic makes you think of? Yeah, it makes me think we just had this Arizona prize competition that the Community Foundation and Arizona Republic and ASU's Morrison Institute um, uh, uh, supported. And actually, I, I led a team um, on resident-led voices for housing and security. And we actually didn't win. We came very, very close. We were finalists. But one of the things we were trying to, to Institute was quality of life uh, for residents to not just be the voice of the table to but be the table and to build their own quality of life plans for their own neighborhoods that are brought into city hall that are brought into planning departments. And we saw that happen in Central City South, whereas when any developer comes to Central City South now, de the development office says you need to go talk to the residents of this community or you will not even get a hearing from us. And so that's been very powerful. And we wanted to take some of that leadership training that was happening and also um, help people to advocate at the at not just the local level of city, but the state level, because we have major challenges in Arizona with housing that could be addressed at the state level. 
and that are, are precluded because they're just, well, I won't go into Arizona politics. So I, I really think it is, we need to focus not just on you know, this data, the data-driven approach, but the approach that's gonna bring people in to encourage activism because people don't necessarily have the time um, to be able to just be instant activists. <laughs> And so to have a leadership training that's run by residents is, is such a good thing for our community. I love the concept of residents being the table, not just resident led, but literally being the table. Mm -hmm. I know we're coming upon the time. I wanted to ask one quick question before we wrap, which is just for all of you, all four of you, is there anything that surprised you, pleasantly surprised you even uh, about the project where you said, ah, didn't expect that, but that's, that's a good thing. So I can start, um, and Angelique's right, I tend to be a little bit of the optimist side. I, I am pleasantly surprised and um, feel like it was a toe in the water of the directionality we need to go, which was we saw equity shifts in dollars and, and we saw them quickly. And so the concern is of course shifting back, but you know, a surprise was that when institutions set their mind to it, they actually did do it and we saw the dollar shift in ways that really benefited, we hope, the communities. I'll, I'll say, you know, um, my optimistic piece comes from the people that were involved in this. You know, there are warriors inside of institutions across the city that this last year changed all of us. And so in many ways we the walls fell away from our institutions and we just linked arms. We spent our time, our intellectual resources. You know, we did our best work together. And my admiration of people like Megan and Jennifer who, you know, showed up week after week just went through the roof. And I stopped feeling like I worked at an institution and started feeling like I worked on, on behalf of this bigger goal and this bigger outcome. And that, that's pretty powerful. I would add that in Tempe, if this data and this study had been brought to us a couple of years ago, I'm not sure it would have been as welcomed. And it's not because of who was on the council or who was mayor, but I think COVID has brought to light inequities that many of us have seen before, many of us have lived before, um, but has brought forward inequities in a sense that, wow, we, we have a tsunami, an impending tsunami ahead of us, and we, we need to understand this issue thoroughly. And then it made us realize like that the data the county is not what we need it to be. If we really want to affect change, we need to involve regional governments as well. Um, so the timing couldn't have been better. And for the city of Tempe to see that we're going to be part of a pilot program with this tool that's being developed is sort of an added bonus. I'm just glad my city is, is you know, is, is all cities are bureaucratic, but our city is makes waves in the desert. That's our, our tagline. And I'm, I'm so glad we're willing to, to pick up this collaboration and, and support it and engage with it. Yeah, I, I think I'll just echo everyone's uh, sentiments. I think that there's better understanding um, if there's you know a silver lining at all from from the past eighteen months of of the need for data, um, of the lack of data that we have around housing loss, and then excuse me, um, just a, a willingness to engage in these tough conversations around inequities in, in, in housing. I think people are a lot more willing to do that and, and to work towards uh, addressing some of these issues. Marvelous. Well, I, I think I'm wrapping us up. I'm going to look to see if anyone does this. Uh, okay, good. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being here today, everyone who joined us. Uh, obvious, endless thanks to Angelique Power, Jennifer, Ax Jennifer Axelrod, Tim Robustelli, and Council Member Lauren Kuby uh, for joining us and being our resident experts. Thank you, Megan Dugan Bassett, for getting us all together. Thank you to my co moderator, Autumn McDonald, uh, and to all of our colleagues at New America. You can look on Twitter at Molly G. Martin to find some of the resources we talked about today. And a recording of this will be made available on New America's YouTube channel shortly. Please don't forget to join us for the second in the Mapping Inequities series on July 20th at 2 p.m. Central. Thank you all. Be safe, stay well. And I remember the overall lesson from today is we are only as well as our least well neighbors. So, so go out and do good things and take care of each other. Thank you so much. <laughs>